Hello, everyone. So excited to welcome you to our webinar today. My name is Shirley. I'm with the API Institute on Gender-Based Um I'm assuming you guys can all hear me, so I'm just going to plow on. Just want to take a quick moment to say um, we know that these times are unprecedented ones, and there's a lot on everybody's hearts and minds, to say the least. Um, a lot has changed, and we know that many of you who work in shelters or in direct services with survivors have felt the strain. And so I and the presenters want to thank you for taking the time today to um, learn about this important issue, which is still affecting many women and girls worldwide. And of course, we also want to say we hope that you and your loved ones are taking care, and thank you for the work that you have done and continue to do for survivors. Um, I just want to do a quick roadmap of the presentation ahead. Sound is clear. Sorry, I'm just looking at the chat, making sure everybody can hear me okay. Uh, just a quick roadmap of the presentation. We're going to be providing a brief overview of FGMC, uh, including what the term means, ways that it's practiced around the world, the impacts it has on survivors. Uh, we'll be describing the history of the anti-FGMC movement in the United States, some of the current movements that's going on, and what some of the laws say. We'll then talk about how this issue connects to the broader gender-based violence work and why FGMC is a form of gender violence, and um, you know how that connects to domestic violence sexual assault um, field as well. We'll then talk about, uh, of course, resources for service providers, and we will be putting uh, some time at the end for questions and answers. Throughout the presentation, we will be showing a few videos from the Voices to End FGMC project, which Maria will tell you a little bit more about. If you are not joined in via computer audio, unfortunately, you won't be able to get any of the audio from these videos, but we will be sharing the links to all of the videos along with all of the rest of the Voices videos so that you can watch them separately. Um, it's a really cool project, um, elevating the voices of survivors and those impacted by FGMC. So uh, either way, I would encourage you all to watch them anyway. We will be recording this webinar and sending the recording and slides to everybody once they're ready, about a week after today. Throughout the presentations, if you have questions, reactions, comments, feel free to put them in the public chat box, uh, and we will leave some time to respond to them at the end. Uh, like Daniel mentioned, there are some tech issues today, or hopefully um, we'll be able to provide um, you know, clear audio throughout, but just bear with us if those tech issues do show up. Quickly introducing the speakers today, Maria has worked in the anti-gender violence field for over a decade in research policy, program development, and direct service. She is the co-founder and executive director of SAIO, which empowers, Asia, uh, sorry, empowers Asian communities to end female genital cutting. And then we have Dr. Ada Khan, who is the network coordinator for the U.S. and FGMC network providing technical oversight and day-to-day -day management for the implementation of the network's activities. Uh, that, <clears throat> excuse me, the network's goal is to eliminate FGMC by connecting, supporting, elevating, and advocating on behalf of and with diverse United States stakeholders engaged in prevention, education, and care. Um, and as for myself, I'm not going to be doing much speaking, but uh, the Asian Pacific Institute on Gender-Based Violence is helping to organize today's webinar. Uh, we are a national resource center that provides technical assistance, training, resources, and other support for advocates and communities uh, working on gender violence issues in Asian Pacific Islander and Native Hawaiian communities. So I'm going to turn it over to Maria. Thanks so much, Shirley, um, and welcome everyone to this webinar. I, hopefully you can all hear me as well uh, and apologize for any of the um, sound issues. Um, we're really so glad you all are joining us. And just a quick note that this next section that I'll be covering is really going to discuss the who, the what, where, and when in terms of uh, FGMC or female genital mutilation slash cutting. And also throughout the webinar, as Shirley mentioned, we will be showing short videos created by survivors to help highlight the nature of FGMC um, within communities. 
And these are part of the Voices Project, which I will mention in a little more detail in just a bit, that we initiated with our partner organization, Story Center, about three years ago. Um, so in terms of how we're going to start, we wanted to understand, um, before we dive into the content, just to get a better question, um, understanding of who's on the webinar, and what experience folks have with this issue, we wanted to start off with this question. And um, the question is, how many people know someone who has experienced FGM slash C or female genital mutilation slash cutting? And you should be able to answer this question um, by, I believe, raising your hand. Or if you could write in the chat box um, your response to this question, that would be wonderful and help us gauge you know, who is on this webinar as well. And we'll give everybody about one to two minutes to respond to this question here. So this is Shirley again. If you want to um, use the hand raise feature, it looks like a little person with his hand up at the top left of the screen. If you click the little drop down arrow next to the person, you can, uh, I guess, raise hand probably would be the best option or agree. Thanks, Shirley. Okay, so it looks like um, we've got quite a mix of responses from some folks who have not come in contact with someone who's undergone it, others who have, including family members, friends, looks like health professionals who have been working with survivors. Quite a few people have raised their hands as well. And it looks like we have some survivors. Thank you for joining us. OK, great. So it looks like we do have quite a mix of um, folks in terms of your knowledge and your experience and your background with this issue. Um, just so everyone knows, we are going to uh, start with just sort of a general understanding of what FGMC is. And because of time restrictions, we won't be able to dive into it as deeply as we would like, but we do want to introduce the topic and go through the agenda, as Shirley mentioned. So thank you again, everyone, for responding. Um, to move forward, just so that everyone is on the same page, um, we wanted to start with the World Health Organization definition of female genital mutilation slash cutting, or FGMC. Um, FGMC comprises all procedures that involve partial or total removal of the external female genitalia or other injury to the female genital organs for non-medical reasons. It is recognized internationally as a human rights violation, torture, an extreme form of violence against women and girls, and it is usually performed between birth and puberty. Throughout this pre presentation, we will be referring to the practices FGM slash C, but it's important to note that there are many different terms for it, and some of these terms are indigenous to the community practicing it. So for example, um, it might be referred to as Sunna, it might be referred to as Katna, um, and there are various names. One thing just in general to be cognizant of, in particular if you are a frontline professional or service provider, is if you are working within communities, and you might all be aware of this as well if you are already working with communities, um, it's often helpful to refer to the practice in the same way that the community members you are referring to it are doing. And that's just also helpful in terms of engaging in conversation and dialogue. But for our purposes here, we'll be talking about it as FGMC, or I might refer to it as FGC. Okay, um, so there are various physical forms of FGMC, and the World Health Organization has categorized these into four types. In general, these four categories are very broad in themselves, but to give you the definition of the categories, 
type one, um, which you can see, you can see the different types on this chart, but type one excision is removal of the clitoral hood with or without removal of part of the clitoris. So again, it's a pretty broad range, but it um, can be from a very minor procedure in terms of um, what is removed to something that involves removing all the clitoris. Type 2 is partial or total removal of the clitoris and the labia minora with or without excision of the labia majora. Type 3 involves narrowing of the vaginal orifice with creation of a covering seal with creation of um, a covering seal by cutting and apositioning the labia minora and or the labia majora with or without excision of the clitoris. And it's also referred to as infibulation. And in general, um, types 1, 2, 3 range in terms of physical severity from type 1 being known as some of the least severe forms in terms of physical severity that is ha that is being done to type 3 being the most severe. Um, and then there's a type 4 which usually includes pricking, piercing, cauterizing. It is generally known as the other category. Um, and we go through this just to give an understanding of what FGMC involves. But again, um, note that these categories are very broad and there are many different forms that are happening in different communities throughout the world. So with that in mind, we are going to start with Aisha's video. And this is the first video that we'll be showing from the Voices Project. And really, we wanted to show these videos to help. We can give you information about FGMC, but it really helps to actually hear from uh, survivors about the impact, about what it is, and to really understand, get a deeper understanding of what it is. So this project, Voices to FG and FGMC, is about mobilizing a critical mass of storytellers and activists from across the globe by bringing people together to share and heal from their experiences of female genital mutilation or cutting, to connect, to end grow as leaders in their communities and create short videos that call for an end to this harmful practice. And in this first video that we will watch, um, Aisha mentions the Sunnah version of FGMC, which in general is considered one of the least severe forms. And we'll be playing it on the screen, but as Shirley had mentioned previously, if you are calling in via phone audio, unfortunately you won't be able to hear the video audio. We will of course be sending around the PowerPoint with the links after the webinar. And you can also go to Seo's YouTube channel to find all the videos from the Voices Collection. And then also, if Gada or Shirley, you wouldn't mind typing in the URL for the video in the chat box, we can share it with participants that way too. So as the video plays, um, we do want to just let everyone know we would love to get your responses and your thoughts. So please feel free to continue uh, typing in your responses on the chat box. And um, due to time, we won't be able to reflect on each video, but we really welcome comments and continued discussion on the chat box. Okay, and then we would like to play the video, Aisha's video. When I was five, my grandma took me to see a lady. They pulled a curtain closed, made me lay down, and then cut me. My dad didn't want it done to me, so my grandma did it when he was out of town. He was mad later, and my two younger sisters have not been cut. For years, I made fun of girls who hadn't had it done. We thought we were better than they were. Our whole family moved to the States, and when I was about 12 to 13 years, I overheard my mom and my auntie arguing. My auntie wanted to have her daughter cut, even though she herself had needed to be cut open again to have sex. And then wasn't able to have a vaginal birth. I heard my mom tell my auntie, you don't need to do it. Look at my two daughters, they're fine. I had to confront my mom. Why was she sticking up for my cousin when she hadn't for me? She told me she had felt bad about letting my grandma and my great grandma take me that day. She said yes, I allowed it, but I made sure it was the sunnah the least harmful kind. Digging deeper, I learned it's not a religious practice. It's a cultural thing that's passed down. There's nothing in the Quran about it, but aunties and grandmothers do it. 
if you hadn't had it done, you're considered promiscuous. Men ask you, magudan tahay. If you're not, they get turned off. At least the newer generation is talking more openly about it. I thought it was normal for a long time, but I think differently now. I hope my story will end the woeful ignorance on the issue of FGC. So please feel free to type in your responses or your thoughts, uh, reflections to that video in the chat box. Um, and we definitely encourage that throughout this webinar and uh, every time that we are able to watch a video too. So that was the first video. Um, in it, you might have noticed that Aisha starts discussing reasons for why FGMC is done in her community, which we will discuss in a bit later on. But I wanted to make note of her mentioning that it is done because of various reasons. Aisha mentions religion and the idea that a girl would be promiscuous if she doesn't have it done. Also, Aisha discusses some of the pain associated with it, including health complications that have happened to relatives of hers who have had it done which takes us to our next slide. FGMC um, can have lifelong health consequences that start right after being cut and into all stages of a girl's life, some of which include chronic infections, hemorrhage, severe pain during urination, menstruation, sexual intercourse, and a few other reasons that are listed on um, the PowerPoint slide. This is by no means an exhaustive list here, so there are uh, many other physical complications that can occur too, but uh, we wanted to give you an idea of some of the complications that can occur. And I also want to mention that not all survivors experience the same complications. Um, it does vary survivor to survivor, and that depends on a host of reasons from uh, the type of cut that's happened and other um, factors too. Okay, so then that's going to take us to our next video. And to really help highlight some of the physical challenges, we will be next watching Renee's story. Um, so here again, please feel free to comment on the chat box. And let's play Renee's story. I was born in 1944 to a loving Midwestern American farm family. We were close to the earth and our animals. When I was three, my mother became concerned that my face turned red when I touched my clitoris. She brought me to a doctor, and the doctor cut me. My mother said, don't ever talk about this. I was alone with my questions as a child, teenager, and young adult. I did not discuss nerve damage discomfort, even with my sisters. When I gave birth to my first child, I did not talk about the complications I faced. I wanted a natural labor, but the doctor didn't know what to do. He put me on to perform an extensive episiotomy. I awoke four hours after my, my daughter was born, and it took my body months to heal. I told a couple from my church about what had happened to me as a child. They said, don't ever tell that story again. Later, I shared with women at work who said, don't repeat that or you'll ruin your career. But is this really my shame? What about other women having their babies with doctors who don't know what to do? I could not stay silent, and I started reaching out to new people. 
My Somali friend Filsan Ali and I produced a bilingual brochure for infibulated Somali women to give give to their doctors to make safe labor and delivery. Plants. I went public internationally, and my close friends and family supported me. Creating art and connecting with nature has helped me heal. I've learned to spin wool and weave on a loom. I have found peace in flower gardens, weeding, deadheading, and making bouquets. Today I live where eagles soar and deer feed by a river. I hope my story will help people be aware that girls have been cut in cultures throughout the world. All right, um, so that was our next video. Please feel free to share your thoughts, reflections in the chat box, and it looks like people already have been doing, but I um, encourage and welcome all of you to continue doing so. So uh, I mentioned that I share this story because for several reasons, one of which is Renee mentioned some of the health complications around childbirth that happened to her as a result of FGMC. Um, another is that I share Renee's story because it, for many people who are not familiar with this issue, it becomes a shocker because people don't, um, there are many misconceptions around who FGMC occurs to. And Renee's story really helps highlight that this is a global issue occurring to women and girls of all different backgrounds. And that here in the United States, actually up until the 1950s, there was a form of FGMC, often referred to as clitoridectomies, uh, that was performed to treat women women for what was known as hysteria to stop masturbation um, and stop lesbianism. So in Renee's case, it was to stop her from masturbating. But that was something that is almost a forgotten history in terms of the, what the history and connection, the United States' history and connection to FGMC from the past. Um, one other note about FGMC that is important to, to recognize, that is there is a growing concern, particularly in countries such as the United States and other countries as well, but that FGMC is becoming medicalized and that it is being performed by health professionals almost as a way to justify it and make it appear safer. And this will be mentioned later on, but there was a doctor charged in 2017 for performing FGMC in the United States. All right, um, so female genital cutting or mutilation also does affect survival's mental health. Um, and this is an area of research that has only started to be collected in the past few years, really, in terms of recognizing the long-term mental health consequences of FGMC. But some of the mental health consequences can really result in poor sleep, fatigue, generalized body pain, limitations in daily activity, poor self-perceived well-being, altered sexual function, um, and again, this is not an exhaustive list, but this is just to give you an idea of some of the mental health effects as well. It's really important to recognize, again, that not all survivors are going to experience every single after effect, whether it's physical or mental health, but trauma does manifest differently in the individual and in relation to their circumstances around how they were cut and their reactions to it. And so one reason we are sharing the different videos is to show how it has affected these women differently, although there is a thread connecting them all in the fact that they have experienced it. So with that in mind, we're going to share the next video, which is Tasneem's story, which is called A Sense of Loss. 
And this next video really does help to emphasize the mental health consequences of FGMC. In particular, as Tasneem um, discusses how she was searching for validation for the pain that she experienced. So if we can play Tasneem's story. When I turned 40, I felt brave enough to seek counselling. It took me a long time to be ready to deal with the grief and trauma of FGM and the guilt I experienced after speaking up about it and exposing my family and culture's dirty secret. Once I began counselling, I wanted to know firsthand what was done to me and if it would explain why I was childless. Up to that point, all the medical professionals I had seen for various reasons over the years had completely ignored my FGM during examinations. This time, I got an appointment with a female FGM specialist. I told her my FGM was done in a medical setting when I was seven years old. After examining me, the doctor said that what happened to me had nothing to do with whether or not I could get pregnant. Then she said, women's vaginas and clitorises come in different shapes and forms. Every woman's body is different. I can't see any visible scarring. You could have been born this way with no visible clitoris. Looking back now, I think she meant to be kind and put my mind at ease. But her words that meant to offer comfort only caused more suffering. I had wanted a doctor's validation and acknowledgement that the FGM was real and not something only in my mind. Instead, her failure to listen to what I had told her about being cut and her focus on the lack of physical evidence just emphasized the pain. I'm lucky I was mutilated in a way that left all right so again feel free to write any reflections or thoughts no regarding this video but um, and again we wanted to share this video because it really felt After like it was um, important to help I've got explain the mental health consequences that can occur yet, for FGMC regardless of the type and... of FGMC that is done to a person So another area that we wanted to talk about um, is how FGMC can also impact one's sexuality. Um, in 2017, SEO, which is the organization that I co-founded with four other women, conducted a study in which we surveyed um, 385 women from the Bora community, which is a community that I grew up in, to understand how prevalent FGMC was within the community. We found that it was very prevalent, about 80% of the community had experienced it. We also asked the question of if it had affected their sexual life. And we found that 309 women had mentioned that um, they had undergone FGMC and 35% believed that it had affected their sexual life while 32 percent just weren't sure and part of that is also just including that there is a general lack of awareness um, about female anatomy and how things function 
um, of the 32% who responded that FGMC affected their life, which was about 108 women, 87% said that it affected it negatively. And with that in mind, we're going to show you the next video, which is by Lena. Um, and Lena's video really helps to highlight how she learned that FGMC was done to control her sexuality. And she really does talk more about how it's affected her over her adult life as well. It's 1980. I'm seven years old on summer vacation in Karachi, Pakistan. One morning, my aunt comes to take me shopping. I'm excited. We head to Sadar and stop at an unfamiliar apartment building. My aunt says, I just have to run an errand. I follow her into a dark entrance up two flights of stairs. We pause outside a badly scratched door and my aunt rings the bell. An elderly woman greets us. She's dressed in a ghagra koti and her head is covered with a dupatta. The apartment is cramped and hot, musty. The woman leads us into a brightly painted room. Suddenly and without any warning, she grabs me and pushes me onto my back. She strips off my panties and spread eagles me with well-practiced efficiency. Before I know what's happening, I feel a sharp, hot pain between my legs. As I cry out, she says, It's triumphantly done. She quickly bundles me into a cloth diaper and brings me to my feet. Only then do I notice a pair of old scissors with blood on them on a tray next to her. I hear my aunt say, Auntie ne salam karo? I obey. The whole thing takes less than 15 minutes. I'm filled with shame. My mom had caught me exploring my body a few weeks before. This is a sin, she'd said. So I believe I have been punished. Over the years, I've wondered. Would I have grown up more confident if I'd never been cut? Would I have been better able to appreciate and enjoy my body? Or been more comfortable with sex and intimacy? I will never know. I think back to that salam and my blood boils. I hope my story will break the circle of silence that has allowed genital cutting to continue. So again, um, feel free to make comments. And thank you to Shirley and Gada for uh, sharing resources. And for others I see that are sharing resources too. I think that's wonderful. Um, we can get back to the PowerPoint. Great. Okay, so throughout these videos, you've started to hear some of the different reasons for why FGMC continues in various communities. And you might have picked up on um, various storytellers were talking about various different reasons. To sum it up in general, FGMC is considered a social norm within many communities. And that really means that it has been justified in all sorts of ways so that it can continue generation after generation. Um, some of the reasons we've really, we have heard about throughout these stories were that it was done to curb sexual desire, to prevent promiscuous behavior. Uh, it was done for religious reasons. It was done for culture. Some other reasons really um, are connected to the idea that it's a tradition or marriageability, meaning that in some communities that a woman uh, to be eligible for marriage must undergo it. It can also be connected to reasons of cleanliness and purity. And... Um, I have, we have in our study also showed that 
uh, some women and some communities have heard that it actually increases sexual pleasure. There are many other reasons given, such as the rite of passage for womanhood. Um, it's, a, it's aesthetically more pleasing um, and some misconceptions that the clitoris is dangerous. So again, there are a variety of reasons um, and really it is something that's been justified in all sorts of ways in order, it's a social norm so that it is continued generation after generation. And with that, I am going to show another video um, from Severina and she talks a little bit about why it's done in her community and really focuses um, on the idea of tradition and that's why she was taught it was done. I'm a Samburu from North From Kenya, the last born girl. In a polygamous family. When I was eight, I started boarding school with Catholic nuns. My dad was. angry with my mom for allowing me to go to school but she supported me just before my My thirteenth birthday, I went back to my village during the Christmas holiday. One morning. I'm a Samburu from Northern Kenya. In Kenya, the last born girl in a polygamous family. When I was eight, I started boarding school with Catholic nuns. My dad was angry with my mom for allowing me to go to school, but she supported me. Just before my 13th birthday, I went back to my village during the Christmas holiday. 
One morning, my mother woke me up and said, You have to be strong. It is and my clothes were removed. milk was poured over me few seconds but it's great to see okay oh I didn't mean to get out of the video I had just paused it to see if we could let it play I heard a woman say, make sure that it's all cut out. Then I passed out. When I woke up, my whole body hurt. I thought about how I'd been naked in front of all those women and I did not want to see anyone. Why would our ancestors pass this act down to I could not accept it. But others do. Women keep it going. And men never asked about what our girls go through. They only say, this is what is supposed to happen. When I speak out to educate young girls, that they can refuse to be cut. Many people say, why are you crushing our traditions? But no one has ever convinced me that the pain of female genital mutilation is justified in the name of culture or anything else. If I ever have a daughter, she will never go through what I went through. I hope my story will inspire us. The survivors. You had a chance to hear some of these stories from survivors. I'm going to talk a little bit more about the data on FGMC in terms of figures and numbers. 
So the current figure is that 200 million girls have undergone or are at risk of undergoing FGMC. And really it's only in the last few years though that the United Nations has recognized FGMC as occurring globally. Um, and that's important to recognize in connection with that 200 million figure. So in 2015, the UN implemented the Sustainable Development Goals, which are known as the SDGs, and in goal number five, intended to help achieve gender equality and empower all women and girls, for the first time called on all countries to collect information on the prevalence of FGMC. Prior to the SDGs implementation, only relevant countries were asked to track this type of data. That meant that FGMC was only measured in the 32 countries in Africa and the Middle East where UNICEF collected the data. Other countries where FGMC was reported, including in the US, had no obligation to track this information. So it resulted in, for decades, millions of women and girls um, not being encountered because they weren't viewed in these relevant countries. However, again, as I mentioned, it has really been recognized in the last few years that this is a global issue. And uh, it is something that there have been a few reports that have been coming up to really highlight that it is happening in other parts of the world and other communities not previously recognized. A couple of reports that have come out recently um, include, and hopefully got in, Shirley could share these links too, but one report that came out found that FGMC is found in at least 92 countries around the world. And this report was carried out by Equality Now, the US NFGMC network, and the NFGM EU network. Um, another report that came out recently that really highlights FGMC in Asia is a consultation report um, that was released by Orchid Project in Arrow. Um, and there is a lot of work being done because, um, unfortunately, a lot of the countries not recognized where FGMC is happening are found within Asia as well. So now getting back to FGMC in the United States. I'm only I'm going to share a couple of figures, but then I'm going to turn it over to Gada to really um, talk about the movement within the United States. So even though we don't have nationally represented data here, the CDC did do some estimates. And the report came out that showed in 2012, over half a million women and girls in the United States had had FGMC performed on them or were at risk of FGMC. However, again, I do want to mention and reiterate that this data is underrepresented because it takes extrapolations from um, the CDC study, meaning that many girls have not been included in the data. So what happens is that that data was based on methodology that involved looking at high prevalence countries within Africa and the Middle East where there was nationally represented data and then looking at immigration patterns here in the U.S. and sort of extrapolating it to determine how many women and girls were um, at risk or had undergone it, which means that many girls um, and many of the women in the stories that you have seen were not counted because they didn't come from those countries or they were born in the United States or it's been happening in generations after generation here in the U.S. Um, the CDC does it has acknowledged these limitations and they are actually working on better tracking the real number of women girls affected in the United States too. So with that, I'm actually going to turn it over to Gada to um, lead us through the next portion. Thank you, Maria, and thank you everyone for uh, joining us today. It's an honor to be here with you all to talk about this very important issue. Um, before I start, I just wanted to ask, um, have any of you heard about the anti-FGMC work here in the U.S.? Um, if you have, please let us know what you've heard on the chat, on the chat box. I'll give you a minute or two just to gauge your response. It looks like we have um, mixed responses with uh, quite a few people who have uh, uh, heard about anti-FGMC work here in the U.S. and a lot who haven't. 
and some who are actually part of the U.S. network and are already familiar with Saheo's work. So this is great, and um, so it's nice to hear that some of you are already involved in the work as well. But let's take a quick dive into what's going on here in the U.S. Um, as you've all seen from the powerful videos that we've uh, just uh, watched uh, so far, that ending FGMC really requires a comprehensive response that puts the voices of survivors front and center. And over, uh, for quite a few de decades now, actually, there has been a variety of organizations working on this issue in the U.S. However, over the past 10 years, uh, a loosely affiliated network of survivors and advocates and organizations have emerged with the intention of advancing a comprehensive multi-sectoral approach to FGMC, FGMC prevention and providing services to those who have been affected because without, with, along with prevention comes the care for survivors. Um, the real aim was to increase that uh, coordination and collaboration among government, frontline workers and professionals and communities um, to end FGMC, and from that, uh, the network, the U.S. and FGMC network was soft launched in 2016 with the first um, F end FGMC summit in D.C., where a comprehensive rec uh, comprehensive recommendations that target these multi-sectoral entities were put forth by the network to continue to bring together organizations here in the U.S. working on this issue. Um, and what the network was officially launched in 2018, centering on the, on the voices of survivors and collaboration, while also taking into account the importance of tolerance, diversity, and, and um, uh, equity in all of our actions. Um, the U.S. and FGMC network also uh, developed a scoping report uh, or a uh, needs assessment to really understand the U.S. context um, and, and build on what's already going on here in the U.S. And what we found was, in general, there's a broad-based increase in awareness on FGMC issues, and that's due to the rec increased recognition that F FGMC really is situated at the intersection of several related topics, including sexual and reproductive health rights, women's rights and empowerment, gender-based violence, and child rights and child, uh, and child marriage as well. Um, we are also seeing that increased awareness due to uh, the FGMC case that Maria had mentioned, and I will go into detail uh, on it later, but also the increase in state laws that uh, um, actually give the issue greater uh, visibility. There has also been an increase in government support, and we do recognize that the involvement of government agency uh, representatives, representatives has been an important dimension of the work in the U.S., after the, the FGMC summit in, 20, in 2016, the interagency working group on FGM was created. There's also, um, we do see that the government is the biggest donor uh, to FGMC work here in the U.S., but also the recognition, the official recognition among uh, government entities through official uh, legislation and um, resolutions that FGM is a form of gender-based violence and a human rights violation is really important. There has been also uh, a great uh, increase in uh, support for research and data collection here in the U.S. As Maria mentioned, there is no national prevalence study here in the U.S. that addresses FGMC, but we are seeing more and more support for funding for initiatives here in the U.S., including from the Department of Health and Human Services, the Department of Justice, Office of Victim Support, as well as um, the CDC now is also undergoing a second hand of uh, data collection, a, a second round, sorry, of uh, data collection uh, to address FGMC here in the U.S. 
Um, there is also a more broad agreement and engagement and collaboration. And that's where we see the US and the FGMC network uh, playing a role in terms of, um, we are now, uh, we now have over 60 uh, member organizations here in the US working on this issue, as well as over 400 individual members working on this issue. But we're also seeing state and citywide coalitions all over the country that are working on this diligently. Um, Survivor-led initiatives, of course, have definitely been front and center. Um, these uh, formidable trailblazers are speaking out in their families, communities, and globally, as you've seen through the videos, and they are owning their stories and sharing them in commanding ways, and this has definitely impacted the movement. And they're doing this through various platforms, such as the digital storyteller story, stories that um, uh, Saheo has been doing. Um, there's also an increased willingness among some communities to acknowledge and speak about the practice. But with this increase in survivor and uh, communities speaking out, we are seeing um, also some backlash from communities or survivors not getting the support that they need from their communities. And here lies the importance of, com the importance of continuous uh, support for survivors, not only in providing the services and, and um, social services that the uh, survivors need, but also in supporting their initiatives. Um, we are also, along with this uh, increased awareness, we unfortunately are seeing an integration of FGMC uh, issues into the anti-immigrant or anti-Muslim agendas, and that is um, uh, unfortunately been a barrier to the work that's being done by m many of our members on the ground, because finding ways to um, shift social norms away from this practice of FGMC is difficult enough without the added burden of working to avoid further marginalizing communities. And here lies the importance of community engagement and uh, um, in, in diversity and looking into the cultural competency issues as well. Uh, one barrier that we are facing also within the movement is the limitations of funding and um, with the majority of organizations working in this field actually having no funding at all specifically dedicated for FGM. And uh, we're hoping that this changes. Um, now, with a brief uh, introduction to the overall picture of the FGMC movement here in the US, I'm gonna briefly talk about um, the laws, FGMC laws, here in the US with the recognition that laws are used as a tool to educate uh, communities and, and also ensure that it is clearly understood that um, FGMC is not an acceptable practice and it is uh, subject to criminalization. Um, so in 1996, the United States passed a federal law making FGMC illegal in the country. And so this was quite a while back. Um, later on in 2013, it, there was a, uh, the inclusion of the travel ban added to the uh, law making it illegal to, um, to take girls abroad to be cut. And that was is termed generally as uh, vacation cutting. However, it was not until 2017 that we saw the first federal prosecution of, um, on FGMC in Michigan, where a, um, in the, and that's with the U.S. versus Nagar, Nagarwala case, where a U.S. doctor was charged with performing FGMC on nine seven-year-old girls from um, Michigan, Illinois, and Minnesota at a clinic in Detroit. Um, this case, again, gained much attention and uh, raised much awareness on FGMC here in the U.S. However, with the advancement of the case um, there in, in 2018, uh, a U.S. district court uh, judge had struck down the federal law uh, based on technical grounds 
uh, with the proceedings of the case, um, indicating that Congress didn't have the authority to pass the law in the first place. So um, because of it, it had no impact on interstate commerce. Now, this was a big blow because this had nothing to do with the actual recognition that FDMC was a criminal act. It was based on a technicality, but it led to the dismantling of our federal law on FGMC. At the time when the law was struck down, there were 27 states that also had additional laws criminalizing FGMC. Um, and then everyone was really moving forward to try to figure out how we can reinstate the federal law. So many um, members of Congress wanted to appeal uh, this decision. First of all, DOJ, the Department of Justice wanted to appeal this judge's decision, but then they decided to withdraw this appeal. And more, more and more members of Congress decided to intervene and um, asking the courts for arguing for an appeal for this case, um, which is usually, which is highly unusual in any sense because this doesn't happen. But it did bring more attention to FGMC here in the U.S. Um, in, two, in 2019, however, the federal court denied the House motion to appeal the, DOJ, the DOJ's decision not to intervene. And so many of our members, um, in, including some of them here on this webinar today, have been advocating uh, relentlessly to um, introduce amendments to the federal law so that we can once again have a federal law in place. Um, the federal law now is being brought, these amendments to the federal law are now, now being brought to the floor uh, for a vote, um, and it's the Stop FGMC Act. But as a, re and, and we're really hoping that this would pa pass through so that we can have a federal law once again, but throughout this process from 2018 to 2020, so much has been uh, being put forth an effort has been being, being put forth from our members to um, work on these laws. And now we have 38 states that have laws um, on FGMC. Um, and we're hoping that in the next few years, all states would have laws against FGMC. And this is just a map to show um, the states that have laws and states that don't. But Really, the conversation here is around our members working uh, diligently to ensure that all girls are protect protected from FGMC. But also, I want to highlight the role of survivors within these efforts, um, as many of the survivors have been working on instating these laws in the different states, including Kentucky, uh, Washington State, um, Massachusetts was still being worked on, um, North Carolina, <laughs> Pennsylvania, and um, which brings me to our next video of one of um, uh, our FGMC survivor advocates and steering committee members who's been also working hard on this issue in the U.S. So if we could play um, Mariam's video, A Sunny Day in Seattle, please. It was a lazy, sunny day in Seattle. I was visiting my niece. She was seven years old, the same age I was when I was cut. I remembered the emerald green carpet, the jumbo-sized Toblerone my aunt gave me as a bribe. She led me to her basement clinic in India. It was just the two of us. And without warning, she laid me on my back, she spread my legs apart, and I blacked out. When it was over, I sat in a corner with the candy bar, feeling sick to my stomach.
I saw my aunt sitting with my cousin laughing and pointing at me. When I confronted my parents years later, they were furious. I learned she did this without their consent. Watching my niece reminded me of the me before I was cut. So confident, so self-assured. In that moment, I felt a wave of emotions. Gratitude she would never experience what I went through and motivation to act. My father told me, the only way to spark change is to speak up. I worried all of my other identities would be erased. Painter, binge traveler, US diplomat, and proud Texan. When people Google searched my name, would this squeamish acronym be the only thing that would pop up? I eventually allowed my story to be published in The Guardian. It sparked a conversation within my community and even within my own family. My brother was with me that summer, and earlier this year, he launched a campaign to push legislators in Washington state to ban FGM. He wasn't able to protect me from my aunt, but his voice has the potential to break future cycles of violence. seeing uh, Mariam's video, I'm going to move it on to Shirley to take it over from here. Hi everyone, this is Shirley again. Um, I know Maria and Gada have done a great job of going over um, everything that's on this current slide, but we thought since FGMC is an issue that's fraught with so many misconceptions, it would be a good idea for you all um, to see some of the, these myths and misconceptions all together on one slide. So I'm just going to go over this very quickly since, um, like I said, Maria and Gada have already spoken on most of them. and We only have about 20 minutes left. Um, so as we heard, FGMC is not one standard procedure. It's performed sometimes with a doctor, sometimes without. Um, and many cultural practices are also woven into it. Um, we've heard Maria talk about the four different types of it. Um, one of the big misconceptions is FGMC only happens in African communities. Uh, it's associated with this religion or this culture or this country. And as we've seen, that's um, obviously not true. FGMC does happen in the United States, as we've seen. FGM uh, can be safe by, me by being medicalized. That's another one of the big misconceptions. It has lasting impacts, as we have seen, um, not just to a woman's health, but also her mental health, her sexuality, um, and her sense of self, uh, self-worth and self-confidence. Um, women and girls choose to undergo FGMC. Um, often that's not the case, as many girls are having this performed um, without even knowing it's going to happen. Um, FGMC has been criminalized in all United and all the U.S. states, uh, as Gada said. Only 38 states have a law against FGMC today, and there is no federal law criminalizing FGMC. Uh, and then, lastly, FGMC is a religious or cultural issue, and we should not condemn it. Um, Maria is going to speak a little bit more about this in the upcoming slides, but um, as we have seen, FGMC is. Um, well, it is a complex issue and has lasting trauma on survivors and um, should definitely be something that we need to work towards ending. I'm going to turn it over to Maria for the next section. Great. Thank you, Thank you Shirley. Um, all right. Um, I've just been seeing all of the messages in the chat box. Thank you, everybody, for sharing all the resources that you're doing. Um, I think that's really wonderful. 
But going to our next section, um, recognizing that we are running out of time, uh, we really did want to have some time to connect it to the broader gender-based violence work, particularly acknowledging that we do have folks on this webinar who are part of um, different parts of gender violence work, from sexual assault to domestic violence. And I think it's often um, helpful to think about how FGMC is a part of gender-based violence and the connection to other forms of G GBV or gender-based violence as well. Um, so we wanted to start this part just really with another question. And again, you can answer by, uh, well, actually, you can't really raise your hand to answer this question. But if you can type in the chat box, um, what connections do you see between FGMC and other forms of gender-based violence, uh, including domestic violence and sexual assaults? Um, thinking about the videos you've seen, the stories you've seen, what are some of the um, similarities that you might see between different forms? So if people could type their responses in the chat box, that would be great. OK, controlling a woman's body and her choices in life, definitely. Lack of consent, yes. I'm just going to read out some of the answers um, that people are sharing. Um, and Shirley and Gada, if you see an answer, please feel free to. Power and control, violation of human rights. I think that shame connects all forms of gender-based violence, which promotes silence about these issues. The normalization of violence. As a, oh, as a domestic violence prevention educator, it's important to see how domestic violence does not happen between men and women, and how not just happen between men and women, how women can hurt other women. Intimidation, emotional abuse, and making the victim feel bad about it. PTSD, OK. So I know we had to restart the chat box, asserting control. Um, I'm seeing a lot of good comments and connections, which is great. Um, one thing I wanted to, and please continue to uh, type your responses, I just wanted to also make um, some connections to is how, like some other forms of gender-based violence, um, we know, for instance, domestic violence is oftentimes learned behavior, um, particularly for children who are growing up witnessing domestic violence in the home. Um, and this is, FGMC is another form of learned behavior, particularly when you see that it is happening within families, generation after generation, too. And oftentimes, when you are taught that something is normalized, as Aisha had mentioned in her first video, she didn't think anything of it until um, others started questioning it. And that is something, again, to recognize that it is a form of learned behavior. Intergenerational trauma, yes, this is definitely another form of uh, generation, intergenerational um, family violence, too, which is a dynamic that we see in other forms of GBV as well. Um, a couple of other things um, I wanted to mention, again, is there can be one thing that many survivors uh, face in undergoing FGMC, particularly if they grow up in communities where you're taught you're not supposed to talk about this. Um, silence is part of what perpetuates this from continuing generation after generation. And I think that silence also we've seen um, helps isolate survivors from seeking out support. And um, I used to work in domestic violence as well. I don't know if I actually mentioned that. But for a very long time, and I know that a sense of isolation is something that um, is very common for domestic violence survivors, particularly in trying to reach out support, reach out for support. And breaking that sense of isolation can be a very important step. All right, it looks like there's a lot of great things here. Because of time, I'm going to actually uh, go to our final video that I wanted to show you. And it just really highlights that intergenerational um, trauma point and the, the fact that this is another form of generational family violence, too. So this is Saza's story that we're going to be watching um, as our last video for this webinar. And we'll include the link in the chat, too.
Saya berdiri di tepi jalan, memakai pakaian ringkas, kemeja T dan seluar jeans. Menunggu ayah menjemput saya dari universiti. Kami sedang menuju ke rumah ibu saudara untuk acara ulang tahun sepupu saya Anissa yang berumur 2 tahun. Assalamualaikum, saya ucapkan semasa memasuki kereta. Ibu bapa dan kakak saya membalas. Waalaikumsalam. 20 minit kemudian, kami tiba di rumah ibu saudara dan terus terbau aroma masakan rendang, lodeh dan sambal goreng yang enak. Rumahnya penuh berwarna-warni. Daripada baju kurung merah dan biru kepada jubah hijau dan juga abaya hitam. Saya mengambil makanan untuk ibu dan diri saya. Dan kami duduk sambil menikmati makanan lazat. Makcik saya membawa sepupu saya yang comel dan dengan bangganya berkata, Dia disunatkan minggu lepas. Mata saya terbeliak. Tulang belakang saya menjadi lurus. Saya hampir terjatuh dari sofa. Dia disunat? Anak perempuan disunat? Saya bertanya. Saya tidak boleh percaya jawapannya. Ya, minggu lalu oleh seorang doktor. Cepat sekali. Snip, snip, dah habis pun, makcik saya menjawab. Tetapi, tetapi ini melanggar hak kemanusiaannya. Ini salah, saya menjerit. Kakak saya memotong perbualan kami. Dia berkata, kamu juga disunat semasa kamu kecil. Mulut saya digantung terbuka. Itulah saatnya saya sedar tentang sunat perempuan dan saya mendapat tahu ia telah berlaku kepada diri saya. Tetapi, mengapa? Untuk apa? Saya menanya ibu. Ibu menjawab, dalam Islam, perempuan patut disunat. Cara ini lebih bersih. Dan kamu tidak akan berzina. Pada saat itulah, saya memutuskan untuk mencabar mitos-mitos sebegini dan melindungi anak-anak perempuan lain di Singapura. Dan sejak itu, saya telah berkempen untuk menghentikan amalan sunat perempuan. share some resources with all of you. Sorry. I think I got cut off for a second there. Can everyone hear me? There. Yes. All right. <laughs> Sorry about that. I know we're running out of time, but I think the question among on everyone's mind is the intersection between FGM and COVID-19. And as Maria um, and Shirley mentioned, there's definitely that intersection. We know the connection between gender-based violence and FGM. And um, now we're seeing also uh, this being played out on, playing out with COVID-19. And while there is a need to gather clear evidence um, on what's really happening on the ground, we can definitely use um, lessons learned from Ebola outbreaks and how um, different public health crises have also impacted the FGM movement. And I'm just going to quickly point out to a uh, source that UNICEF actually put out just a few days ago uh, on the uh, FGMC and COVID-19 
um, and how the different elements, just as we're seeing increased, an increase in gender-based violence across the globe, there are issues that can come to play when it comes to FGM, including uh, the social isolation factors and the loss of access to education and um, services um, and protection services and the loss of livelihoods. But there are also opportunities um, to disrupt the occurrence or the practice and putting out public declarations and um, decreasing the incidence of this and also creating new platforms for education. And so um, I will go ahead and share this resource with you so that you can take a look at it um, in more detail. But the importance, again, is really uh, when having these plans in place uh, for uh, response plans, response plans for emergencies such as COVID-19 needs to actually include and be grounded in um, gender analysis and um, uh, really understanding the increased risks of gender-based violence in, in these situations. Um, and also making sure that there are clear efforts to address things like FGMC or child marriage or any um, uh, harmful practices at this time clearly within conversations around gender-based violence, but also support access to different tools such as this one to increase education and raise awareness and support survivors and prevent this from happening uh, on the ground. But Again, the resources there, I encourage you all to take a look at it. And if you do have any resources also, please do share with us. But we are hearing from our members on the ground who are being directly impacted within their work uh, um, with the current um, uh, COVID-19 crisis. Um, also, when it comes to resources, uh, I know everyone uh, is wondering where can we go to find more information. I encourage you all to um, visit the US and FGMC network website. We have uh, for a uh, list of resources that are catered to specific topics. But in terms of understanding what are the services that are available here in the US for survivors, right now there's growing services around providing survivor support and uh, mental health supports for, for survivors, um, survivor support working groups, um, also trainings for healthcare providers to better understand how they can integrate uh, mental health support within the care for um, survivors, but also really understanding the clinical care aspects uh, of FGM and more and more organizations and uh, within our membership are putting forward great resources. I've, the the um, slide that you see here just is a small list, very, very short list of what is really out there. And we encourage you to really um, look into these resources if you are looking to understand a particular issue or a particular area of health um, and, and please do check, check out these uh, different resources um, uh, online for you that are going to be available. And now I am going to move it on to Shirley. So it looks like we don't have much time for questions and answers, um, but if you have any questions, remaining. Uh, you can see our contact information here and feel free to get in touch with um, the presenters or myself if you have any questions or comments or resources to share. We will be, um, like I said, sharing all the links that you've seen today along with all the videos to the voices stories. Um, there are many more voices stories that we did not show today so I would encourage everybody to watch those as well. I don't know if uh, you had any last comments, Maria or Gada, but I just want to say thank you again for joining us today. Yeah, this is Maria. I just want to echo um, what Shirley said and thank you all for joining us. Um, and yes, there are many more stories from the Voices Project and we are continuing that project. And so we will be collecting more stories. Um, we really, again, one thing I didn't reiterate about the Voices Project is all of the uh, 
people involved in the project, all of the women, all the survivor stories, they actually put together their own stories. And really, it's an idea of giving them agency so that they get to create the story, the script, um, really get to focus in on what it is they want to share. And so that's part of the, the kind of beauty of that particular project. But thank you all again. And thank you for sharing so many resources you have in the chat box. Thank you guys for all these wonderful resources and we're going to also be, uh, I'll see which ones we don't have already and add them to our website. So thank you so <laughs> much for attending and thank you for uh, listening and joining us and please do uh, follow us uh, and become part of the network uh, if you're interested in continuing this work. Thank you all.